Hi, this video is going to walk us through the poetry that we read from Wordsworth. Um, you can see in front of you, um, I took the poems and uh, printed them out and then uh, made comments. So um, you'll find, you can find these PDFs under the Wordsworth module in the class, right? So let's start with the world is too much with us. This is a sonnet that Wordsworth wrote in 1802. Um, it is a Petrarchan sonnet that it, or an Italian sonnet. Uh, Italian sonnets were kind of invented by Petrarch <laughs> or that style, so that's why we call it Petrarchan. This is characterized by um, iambic pentameter. All, all sonnets are iambic pentameter, and they have to have 14 lines, and they rhyme. But different sonnets have different patterns of rhyme, and they also have different ways of splitting up the content. So in a Petrarchan sonnet, we're going to have an octave followed by a sestet, which you see I've marked here on your screen. Um, and then the pattern is A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. Now, C, D, C, D, C, D is one of the patterns. Sometimes you'll see C, D, E, C, D, E, or C, D, C, D, G, G, or, or F, F, something like that. So that last few lines can differ, but this is pretty standard uh, Petrarchan sonnet. Um, kind of the theme here is nature versus artifice, the artifice of the city. Uh, the artifice of the institutions that are controlled by the government, the church, whatever, um, and that in nature we can be healed. Right? He does have some personification in simile. Uh, in the, the video on lyrical ballads, I mentioned that Wordsworth does not use a lot of deep metaphors or anything like that. They're pretty straightforward, and so the kind of things we're going to see here are pretty easy to spy if you know what personification and simile is, right? So, so here's the poem. So the octave and the sestet, um, for that kind of sonnet, what you're going to see is in the first eight lines, that's what we call the octave, right? Uh, we're going to see an explanation of the problem that the poet is dealing with. There might be a question that the poet answers. There might be a description of a, of a, predicament that the poet is in, right? And the last six lines, the sestet, provides some kind of response or answer to what has been said in the octave, all right? So, the world is too much with us late and soon. Right? So, you see I've marked it using the U for unstressed syllables and the slash, the forward slash for stressed syllables, and then the green lines between that marks the feet, right? So if you looked at that video or read the handout on Poetic Scansion that I uploaded, um, you'll know that the I am is the heartbeat uh, pattern. Ba-bum, 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 right? And however many of those individual units, ba-bums, you have, right? You mark that, and then you count those up, and we call those feet, right? So we can see here in the first line that we have five I am's in that row, and that's why it's pentameter. So, and that's what sonnets are written in. Now, that doesn't mean that it's perfectly regular. There are some off beats and things like that, but for the most part, it falls into that regular rhythm, right? Now, when we read poetry, we read to punctuation, not to the end of the line, right? And so that will help us keep from being sing-songy. Uh, and also, I mean, this is the underlying rhythm, but it doesn't mean that you sing it like da 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 right? There are going to be, when it comes to stresses, there is stressed and unstressed, but sometimes you have soft stresses, right? That they're not as powerful, right? There really is no way of notating that, but not everything is the same intensity, right? So the world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers, for this, for everything, we are out of tune. There's that first part. There's the predicament that he's in. Not just him, but everyone, right? We are out of tune with nature. And if you remembered one of the themes that's, that's 
presented in the lyrical ballads is that we need to be in harmony with nature, right? So what's the, what's the answer? Well, he says in the sestet, it moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn, right? So there's kind of his response, right? Rather than continuing to follow all of the civilized rules of society, He'd rather be a pagan. He'd rather go back and, and follow some archaic creed that would at least keep him in touch with nature, right? Um, I do want to point out that, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. If you look, if you look in your copy, you'll see here that we would say wreathed, right? But whenever you see a word, and it's usually going to end in ed for some reason, if you see an accent over it in poetry, you have to consider, do I need to pronounce that syllable in order to make the pattern fit? Sometimes you won't. Sometimes the pattern doesn't need it. And we're going to see that sometimes we've got um, words that we allied the syllables. We don't necessarily we kind of put them all together really quickly. That's just the that's just poet, poet, poetic uh, license, if you will. Right. Now, in terms of personification, personification is the poetic technique where you give human qualities to inhuman, inanimate objects. So here we see nature is capitalized with an N. So if we see these abstract concepts or these non-human things that they have capital letters and it's not because they're the first word of the sentence, then that's a clue that they are personifying it. They're making it a proper name, proper noun. So um, the C, she bears her bosom, right? Well, the C doesn't have a bosom, literally, and it's not a she, but this is personification, right? So you're going to see personification throughout. We also have simile. That's a comparison using like or as. And he says, you know, that these things are upgathered like sleeping flowers, right? So um, again, these are the more common um, ways that Wordsworth uses poetic language, right? And I think you can see that, you know, the answer to this, like we see that this nature is healing, right? The next poem is My Heart Leaps Up, one of probably his more famous ones. Very short. This is an uh, iambic tetrameter primarily, but there is a line of dimeter, uh, of trimeter and pentameter. So this is, again, that romantic ideal that you don't have to follow any regular form, right? Um, so, so it isn't, right? It's not like the sonnet. In this one, um, we do have personification. My heart leaps up like a heart doesn't leap up, right? Uh, and the theme is here is like nature as moral compass and the importance of being like a child. And I mentioned that in the Lyrical Ballads lecture about how Wordsworth had this idea about that we need to go back to nature. We need to be we need to recover our childlike innocence and honesty and openness, right? So uh, we see the rhyme scheme A, B, C, C, A, B, C, D, D. So again, no regular rhyme. We do have repeating rhyme, but nothing that follows a particular pattern. So this is a very good example of that whole idea of recollecting something later on um, to help you out, right? So my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky, so was it when my life began? So is it now I am a man? So be it when I shall grow old or let me die. The child is father of the man and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. So this really expresses Wordsworth's belief in nature and how it's healing and it, it should be the, the through line throughout your life. He says, I'd rather die than to grow old and lose it, right? He says now, he says because he's in the present, right? He says in the past, that's the way it was. In the present, now that I'm, in a ma I'm a man, I'm an adult, it is. And when I'm old, it's going to be the same or else let me die right now because I don't want to lose that connection to nature, right? Because that's natural piety. That's where your moral compass is, right? Uh, and again, the child is father to the man and is one of those famous lines uh, that he has written, right? 
So I wandered lonely as a cloud. This is the one that is going to really connect with this idea about when you're home and you're miserable, open up your memories to a time when you were happy, right? It is an iambic tetrameter. It's fairly, uh, it it's, follows that pattern throughout. And we can see there is a regular A, B, A, B, C, C, D, E, D, E, F, F. This isn't a special form like a sonnet where you, you write a sonnet and you have to follow the rules and all that. But he does have a regular rhyme and rhythm pattern here, right? And you can see he uses simile, personification, and hyperbole. Hyperbole is exaggeration, right? Uh, and so we can say, he said, I, taught, I saw 10,000 at a glance of these daffodils, right? Well, no, right? Um, so that's that exaggeration, just to give us the sense of how, how many there were, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And then here in the bottom, and we'll read through it, um, we do see where he's talking about the spontaneous overflow of emotions that are recollected in tranquility. And then the very end gives us the purpose of poetry. So let's read through it. So I wandered lonely as a cloud. So here's a simile, right? And we think about clouds, right? Clouds are kind of separate. They're up there and there's other things around it, but they don't connect to each other, right? And they're blown by the wind, right? They're, they don't seem to be beings that control themselves. So we have this sense that he's just kind of meandering, right? So he says, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or veils and heels. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So here's that personification. Daffodils is not capitalized, but it does give it the human qualities that they're dancing, right? So he says, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never ending line along the margin of a bay. 10,000 saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. So here's the stanza where he's looking at it and he's saying like, how could I not, a poet, right, a man who speaks to man, a man who is connected to nature, how could I not be happy? Jockin means joyful, right, uh, happy, right? He says, how could I not be happy? How could not my spirits live? So remember, I was lonely as a cloud at the beginning, and then now I'm amidst these daffodils, and I don't feel so lonely anymore. And he says, and I gazed. I said, but I didn't even begin to imagine what wealth I had really had. Now we're going to see this repeated in Tintern Abbey when he talks about what he was like five years when he first saw Tintern Abbey and then what he's like now five years older, right? So this is a repeated thought that sometimes you don't understand the true experience and that's why you have to go home and be tranquil and meditate and then you get it. So here's that last line, that last stanza. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Isn't that just amazing? I hope you've had a, mo a moment like that at least once in your life where you're just kind of down or, or he says pensive, right? That's thoughtful, right? Or vacant. He's just not even thinking of anything. He's not focused on anything, right? So it's not necessarily he's in a bad mood. It's just, eh, right? He's laying down on his couch. He's in the city. He's not there in the middle of, na of, of nature. And he says he, it, that inward eye, and that's the eye that the poet, you know, has to develop, right? The one that sees not what's in front, but what's eternal, if you will, right? He says that's the bliss of solitude. Being able to to see with that inward eye. That's what happens when you can be alone, right? Nobody's jabbering at you or distracting you, right? You can think, right? And he says, and then oh, I was happy again, just like I was when I was in the midst of those daffodils, right? Now you can Google daffodils and lake country and see pictures of just how amazing these fields of daffodils look. I mean, it really is like a carpet of them. They're quite beautiful. So again, this poem clearly shows us those 
those aspects of, uh, of romantic poetry, right? And again, look at the language, very simple. Now, we might not go around and saying, what jock and company, right? But most of this stuff is stuff that, you know, is regular everyday language, and yet it's still quite beautiful and moving, right? <coughs> so London, not a happy poem, right? This is, um, to me, reminiscent of London by Blake, where, you know, he talks about the Chartered Thames and all of that. This is a sonnet. It is a Petrarchan sonnet, though the rhyme pattern is a bit different than the, than the, than, uh, I, um, the world is too much with us. Um, yeah, so it is, a, I mean, I, I think I wrote, I meant tetrameter, but I meant pentameter, so scratch that out. Ignore that little pentameter, I wasn't thinking. In this poem, we have him using apostrophe. So apostrophe is the poetic technique where someone is spoken to in the poem who is not present. They may be dead. Um, it might be an object. Um, you know, Sydney very ha from the Re Renaissance has a famous uh, sonnet where he says, with how sad, stiff, sad steps, O moon, thou climbs the sky. So you could be talking to the moon, right? So here he's talking to Milton who is long dead, right? So this is an apostrophe. We have personification in that England mm -hmm. is uh, labeled as a she um, and is like a fen of stagnant waters. We have metaphor, right? Um, you know, comparing things, um, you know, she is a fen, that's a metaphor. And then we have metonymy. And metonymy is where an object or something that is closely associated with something else is used in place of the something else, right? So metonymy here is where he says altar, sword, and pen. So he doesn't say the church, the military, and literature. He calls them by, the, or in fireside is home, right? He calls them by things that are associated with them. It's like if, when somebody calls a businessman a suit because businessmen tend to wear suits, right? So that's metonymy. So we have that there, right? Um, and so what he's talking about in the octave, right? Because this is Petrarchan, so we have the octave where he's laying out to Milton the problem with England, just how depraved it is, how separated from nature, how it's lost um, its dower, which it says, so a dower is an inheritance, right? And so he says, the ancient English dower, what we have inherited from our, our, our forefathers, right, is this idea of inward happiness, right? Some people say that this is a pretty nationalistic poem, that he's not only calling on one of the most famous of English poets, John Milton, but he's also talking about England as having some kind of natural, you know, inheritance of inward happiness, right? Um, <clears throat> that, again, you can take that for what it is, but it's interesting. He talks about being, they're selfish, right? And he's saying, we need you, Milton, because you are a symbol of virtue, of sacrifice, right? So um, you can, if you scroll down here, I made some notes on the bottom. So again, this is a moralistic poem, so it fits into that idea that poetry should have a purpose. So Milton is important. Milton is, is said to have written the last epic, formal epic in English, because, you know, he did it so well with Paradise Lost that he just kind of ruined the epic for everybody else, right? Um, but I think part of what Wordsworth is referring to here, and especially when you say that he, his heart had the lowest, lowliest duties on, you know, that nature laid on him, right? That Milton, you know, had all these ambitions of being a great poet. He was some who championed um, the right to divorce. You know, he got married to a woman. It was a bad marriage. And he wrote a pamphlet on why people should be able to get married just because they're irreconcilable. They're not compatible, right? He wrote another para, uh, a pa pamphlet called Areopagitica that was about freedom of speech, right? That we shouldn't be censored. Um, he was a highly religious man. He was a Puritan. Uh, and yet he, he also wanted a lot of these uh, freedoms that we kind of take for granted, things that laid the groundwork for what eventually became the Bill of Rights, I, you know, ironically, because the forefathers, our founding fathers in America, read Milton, right? But what's incredible is that when Cromwell and his people, the Roundheads, um, took over the government, they beheaded Charles I, 
Uh, and then for 20 years, they had a republic, right? Um, that Milton put his poetic ambitions on hold, that he became the primary face and voice of this revolution uh, because he had such a reputation in Europe that people respected him. And so he spent his time writing pamphlets and letters and, and documents for the government. And by the time they invited Charles II back in 1640, right? 1620 was when I believe Charles I was beheaded. By the time they invited him back, Milton was quite elderly. He was going blind. Um, he, his health was not great. Um, and, you know, he completed most of Paradise Lost totally blind, which if you've read Paradise Lost, tag Britlet 1 next uh, fall, if you want to, um, you'll note that, oh my gosh, it is a huge, complicated poem, right? And so I think it's that idea that Milton had these virtues that rose above his own ambitions that was for the good of the country, right? So we can see here, you can scan it, you'll see Milton. So there we have what's called that spondy uh, in, in scanning, where sometimes you have two lines of emphasized text. So we could say Milton, or Milton, thou shouldst be living, <laughs> right? It's not going to work that way. So we say Milton, thou shouldst be living at this hour. England hath need of thee. She is a fen of stagnant waters, altar, sword, and pen, fireside, the heroic wealth of hall and bower have forfeited their ancient English dower of inward happiness. We are selfish men. Oh, raise us up, return to us again, and give us manners, virtue, freedom, power. Thy soul was like a star and dwelt apart. Thou hadst a voice whose sound was like the sea, pure as the naked heavens, majestic, Free, so didst thou travel on life's common way in cheerful godliness, and yet thy heart the lowliest duties on herself did lay. So that second part, the first part explains what the problem is, right? Why they need Milton. That second part, that sestet, tells us why Milton then is the person, what it is about him, what are his virtues that are missing now that people in England need to recover, right? Um, right, so our, I think this is our last one. I think Tinder Abbey is the last one. Um, I will tell you that uh, as I read, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but as I read sections at the end, I'll probably cry because I am always moved to tears by the end of this poem. Um, this is iambic pentameter, but uh, it's blank verse. So blank verse is what Shakespeare wrote in, what most of the Elizabethans wrote in. Um, blank verse is just unrhymed iambic pentameter. So we see five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters, and again I hear, and he maintains this. This actually is, for the most part, fairly, really regular. He doesn't have those uh, reversed um, meters at the beginning, like, you know, it, it's iambic, but instead of starting with an unstressed syllable, it'll start with a stress at the beginning of the line, right? It, it does a trochee instead, right? <clears throat> this is actually quite regular. There is no rhyme, though, and it is, I think, a good example of that quality of prose that words were said was totally suitable for um, a poem, right? This is a monologue, so we have one speaker that's speaking. He does talk to the spirit of nature and to his sister Dorothy, but he's not talking to them as they are there right with him. He's talking to them and they'll read the poem and he'll, they'll hear him there, right? So we have details of the landscape, both the inner landscape himself, what's going on inside of him, but also lots of details about what he's seeing around him, right? And so part of this is about how memories of youthful moments in nature can affect us and influence us as adults. Ha, sound familiar? Right. This is a pastoral poem, but traditional pastorals tend to be a little bit fun-loving, lighthearted. Uh, they've got nymphs and shepherds and rustics and all of that. But the romantics took the pastoral and they made it much broader than that. So the pastoral now just becomes something that's set in nature. It doesn't have to have the traditional 
conventions of, of the pastoral from previous eras. I think here you'll also again see that the language tends to be simple, it's ordinary, it's realistic. Now again, we might not say copses and, and orchard tufts, but that's because we have a different kind of simple language today. But for him, this would have, at the time, this would have been pretty simplistic. There are breaks that we have stanza breaks. They're, they indicate a shift in focus of the poem, right? Um, we do see simile, we see metaphor and all that. Not a whole lot. Uh, you'd think with a poem this long, there would be, but there really isn't. There's just a lot of descriptive language about what he's seeing. I think it's interesting, this is called, and again, it's got a long title, Lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey on revisiting the banks of the Wye during a tour July 13, 1798, right? So you can see he wrote this before they published Lyrical Ballads, right? Most of us just call it Tintern Abbey uh, or lines composed above Tintern Abbey. Um, but Tintern Abbey, you can, if you Google that, you'll see some drawings of the Abbey. So this is the ruins of what used to be a religious building, right? Um, and I think that's interesting um, because it's abandoned, and yet there still is something sacred about it. And by, by looking at it and, you know, he's standing above the banks of this river that runs by it, he's having this very spiritual, religious uh, moment. And I think that we could, we could see this as part of the statement that, you don't need formal church to have a relationship with God or to have a spiritual moment that nature is God's cathedral, if you will. I think, I don't know who said that, but I've heard that from romantics before. Um, and, and I think the fact that he sets it here is an indication of this, again, reaction against all the formal social rules, the religious rules, the idea that you have to do A, B, and C, and D to be acceptable, that you can come to the spiritual awakening in many ways, right? Um, so let's let's look at the beginning. So at the beginning, he basically tells us that five years ago, he first visited this spot, right? And it's been a long five summers and five winters when he has been longing to revisit it again because his experience was so profound, right? And he says, and now, today, the day has come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue, right? And he says, and so once again, so he's, he's going down what he's seeing, but he's at this, at the beginning of this poem, he's just, excuse me, <coughs> he's just recalling, he's, he's getting back in touch with what he remembers, Right? And so, <coughs> again, I'm sorry. He says that though it's been a long time since I've seen them, it's not been as is a landscape, landscape to a blind man's eye. So here we have something that's very similar to what we just got through reading in the previous poem. He says, but oft in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them in hours of weariness, sensations sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration, feelings too of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have such, such as perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life. So he's saying that, boy, it's not that I've forgotten them. I have, I have, reconnected with them at those moments when I've been down or alone in that passive, that pure mind, that's that inward eye that he mentions in the other poem, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, and it's also things he says that I'm not even um, conscious of, right? Uh, of the unremembered pleasure. So this is talking about those ordinary things that you do. He says that these are the things it says down here, his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love these two can help us, right? So nature nurtures, nurtures us with our memories. There's a moral influence because of the ordinary acts that we do. And sometimes we don't even remember all of the details, but we still have 
a sense, right? And he says, and nor less I trust to them. I have may, I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. And so he says, it's, you know, by remembering them, this is the other thing. It's helped lighten his the burden that he feels, the unintelligible means un, you can't understand it, right? It's it's confusing, right? And so it helps him. It gives him a serene and blessed mood, right? And he says this is important because it helps, takes us out of our physical existence and connects to the spiritual that, that lets poets see truth. So he says in this in this mood that it, it spawns, right? He says, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. So that's the idea that your soul is not your body, right? And sometimes your body hampers you, right? That's a fairly platonic idea, actually. He says, with, while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. And so again, that's that spiritual connection you have to be joyful. You have to be calm to be able to access it, right? So then we have another turn. We have a stanza break. And he says, okay, if this is, you know, if this be but a vain belief. So maybe I believe this, but it's it's futile, right? He says, yet, I've, I've oftentimes experienced this. He, he can say, I've many times seen my beliefs proved true because I've returned to this spot, in, you know, above Tiern Abbey via my spirit and it's lifted me. So he says, yeah, it's, I don't believe it is vain to believe this. So now we have another break. So notice we have irregular stanzas. The stanzas are not the same lines, right? So now he, he says that, you know, this picture in his mind, the picture of the mind revives again. So there's a metaphor, right? The mind as a picture, right? And, and in here he's talking about that, he he's here in the present, right? And he's enjoying it now, but he knows he's storing up a wealth of future joy, right? He says there is life in food for future years, right? And he says that, you know, no, I'm changed. He says, I know I'm older and I know I'm experiencing nature differently now. And and that's something that he mentioned in another poem, right? That um that, you know, I, I connected to nature as a child. I connected to a man. I'm going to connect to as an old person, right? But in a different way, right? That he still finds sustenance from the view, even though when he was first here, all he saw was just nature itself. He didn't really ponder anything deeper. He enjoyed just everything around him. He says, I came on the hills when like a row, I bounded over the mountains. So a row is a kind of deer, right? So there's a simile, right? And I wandered through the lonely streams. <coughs> and it says, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved, right? So he was always looking forward, but he wasn't necessarily looking for those moments, right? So again, it's like, to me, nature was all in all. I never saw beyond nature. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. But he says, now... So I don't still engage in nature with that energy and that impulse and that rapture, he says, that joy, dizzy raptures, right, that I had as a young person. He says, I'm not, I don't grieve for the, lo the loss of that kind of feeling. He says, because it's been supplanted by something that's just as wonderful, right? Uh, and so he says, for I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. So this music of nature reminds him in a, in a calm and, and, and gentle way, right, of how he should behave. And he says, and I have felt a present that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion in a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, right? 
So hopefully you're recognizing those things that we've seen in his other poems that he talks about in Lyrical Ballads, right? That there's this sublime joy. And it's not necessarily without, it's not just a pleasure, right? He says it's a disturbing joy. Because with these elevated thoughts, you're more aware of not only what's right, what's in harmony, but you're also more aware of what's not in harmony. And I think that's the disturbing joy, right? And he says, and this is the spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of thought. So if you want to be a thoughtful, truly thinking person, you have to be connected. If you're not, then what you're doing really isn't the kind of thinking that we want here, right? And so he says, now he says that this love of nature that he has now is more about the moral guidance it gives rather than just the beauty, right? And so he says, it is nature is the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being, right? Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so, okay, so this is the part that uh, starts getting to me, right? So he says... Uh, this next part is where he talks to Dorothy, his sister. <coughs> and he says, he says, and though I'm happy being here, what makes it even better is that you, my dear sister, are here with me. And you remind me of myself, right? You are experiencing this for the first time and you have that joy in nature itself. And he says, and I see that. And he says, and I pray for her. And this is some more famous lines. He says, and a prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. That's a famous line, right? And that nature, for those who love her, will protect us. So he says, nature can so inform the mind that is within us, right? So that's that inner mind. It can so impress with quietness and beauty and so feed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall e'er prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessings, right? So this is the prayer that he has for her, that no matter how bad it gets, that it'll never rob her of that joy that she understands in her inner mind, right? And so he says that he hopes that she'll grow to see nature as he does now, right? That it, that her mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms. There's a metaphor, right? And he says, um, for all sweet sounds and harmonies, oh, then if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me and these my exhortations? Nor perchance if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence, wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together? And that I, so long a worshiper of nature, hither came unwearied in that service. Rather say with warmer love, oh, with far deeper zeal of holier love. Nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings, many years of absence, these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear, both for themselves and for thy sake. Now, I usually cry at this part, I guess because I'm doing a lecture instead of doing it in front of class. I'm a little bit more conscious, but I think this is amazing because he's saying that not only when you're just alone, but when I'm gone, right? So we got to figure that that could mean when he's dead and he's no longer there to physically remind her that she can remember this. And it's like he'll be there again, right? And that she'll remember, right, that... As much as he loved nature and as much as he benefited from it, that it was more dear because she was there to share it with him. Oh, God, see, I'm tearing up if you could tell, right? So this is almost everything that he believes about what poetry can do, right? It's a common, ordinary moment. They're out for a walk and they see a ruin by a river, right? They're sitting under the sycamore tree, enjoying the spring day. You know, it's it's a common thing, right? The language is ordinary. There's nothing severely elusive or metaphorical or symbolic or anything in here that would make this difficult for us to understand. 
Now, yeah, we have to parse down what he's saying, but it's not like you need a dictionary and an Oxford you know, guide to English literature to get this stuff, right? Actually, if you just stop and look at it, you can see what he's talking about. You can see the personal connection, that emotional intensity here. And it's the idea that he is writing this as a monologue, that he has remembered this moment and he's talking to her, right? So that's Wordsworth. Um, you know, I hope you enjoyed his poetry and that you can see the power of this romantic views here with him. And you can see that very moral thread that runs through his poem. Now, when we get to um, uh, Coleridge here, we're not going to see that strong moral purpose. We can find it. Oftentimes it's implied, but he's dealing with much different kind of topics, right? So, you know, uh, Wordsworth is kind of the, the main moral arbiter of the romantic movement. So um, enjoy, uh, and I'll see you for the Coleridge Lecture. <laughs>